knowledge married to experience is what breeds confidence. I have been at this for a while, but when I'm engaged in something brand new to me, I'm feeling that same level of energy that you feel new to whatever you're new to. Adults are just older children. And so we've got to understand that every time we experience something new, the human side of us kicks in. That's why it's so important for the humane side to stay intact as well. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. Today's episode is brought to you by Gusto. Gusto offers modern, easy payroll benefits and HR to small businesses across the country. They were even named Best Online Payroll by PC Mag. And as a Side Hustle Pro listener, you will get three months free when you run your first payroll. So sign up and give it a try at gusto.com slash SHP. That's gusto.com slash SHP. Hey guys, welcome, welcome back to the show. Today's episode is a rewind episode with Janice Bryant Howroyd, the founder and chief executive officer of the Act One Group the largest privately held women-owned workforce solutions company founded in the U.S. I love this episode because Janice exudes confidence, energy, spirit, and just makes you want to walk into a room and take up space. As Auntie Janice, as I now refer to her in my head, likes to say, knowledge married to experience breeds confidence. When you have the experience and you have the knowledge, you must own that confidence. I listened to this episode two times as I was writing to the Today Show for my parents, and it really did give me confidence that morning. And I often re-listen to this episode whenever I'm nervous about rising to a new level in my business. So I hope it does the same for you. So let's go ahead and do a little rewind. So welcome to the guest chair, Janice. Thank you, Nikayla. It's so fun to be here. It's so fun to have you. So tell me, I understand you are one of 11 siblings and I've heard you talk about your fun upbringing. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you came to be bitten by the entrepreneurship bug? (laughs) Well, let's just be very clear. There may have been more angel wings attached to that than actually my appetite for it when you talk about entrepreneurship. However, there were certain dy- certainly dynamics in place in my family life growing up that uh, I think do- did groom me better than even my education did for entrepreneurship. Let me share with you what I think that's about, Nikayla. Um, We were 11 kids, one mom, one dad. We were in the deep south and I am pre-civil rights. So for the earlier part of my education, my public education, I attended segregated schools. Some of your listeners may be aware of what I'm talking about when I talk about segregation in the deep south. Um, Some of them may actually have read about it, even if they are not old enough to have experienced it in a formal way. But what happened is that mom and dad really instilled in us so many disciplines and principles around how we behaved as a family oftentimes on a limited income, that much of that really did play a role in how I built my business and candidly, how I continue even today doing business in over 22 countries to uh, manage my business, both my resources and to lead and uh, service the people who I work with. So the dynamics of having a great mom and dad who in many uh, instances had to cooperate with each other, even if they were not in cooperation privately from us. I'm sure they had their moments where they just didn't see eye to eye. They always were a unified force when they uh, spoke with us and worked with us as kids. And I might say they even extended that to the community. I actually thought we were quite wealthy growing up. It was in university that I discovered that we fit poverty levels in the U.S. because we did not have a impoverished uh, mindset. We had lots of food and we always had something to give to a neighbor or help someone with. Mom used to have gardens, Nikayla. I don't know if you're familiar with the Deep South or with the idea of summer, winter, spring, fall gardens, but we grew food all year long on three sides of the house and we grew flowers on the front side. Oh, that's and- amazing. 
I still do that today, even in my estate here in California. Oh, that's amazing. And and you know, what an experience to be able to have as someone who's growing up. And I, I absolutely relate to not having an impoverished mindset. I mean, I grew up in the Bronx and I never knew that technically people would look down on me and think I had less than them until I too went to college. So I can relate to that. Um, let's talk a little bit about your college experience. So I understand you went to North Carolina and what was your initial career North path? North Carolina a and State University. I did for it. <laughs> I love it. So, so when oh, you... I got the HBCU bug. If yes. you want to talk about bugs, I definitely love my HBCU. Right. What was that experience like? Where did you think you would be after college? Well, what that experience like and where I thought I'd be after college are two different things. That experience was really one that was very welcoming in some ways and absolutely shocking in a positive and astonishing way in others. Um, My sister and uh, brother had attended university at A&T before me. A&T is our family school. Everybody went there uh, and continue to go there. I've got uh, three, uh, four uh, nephews there now. But the thing is, so much of what they learned and experienced was shared at home. And by us being such a clannish family, we were aware of everything that was going on in their lives. They didn't go to university and then just show back up for Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner uh, in the South, Easter dinner as well. What they did was share with us through letter writing. People don't do that as much today, but stamps, U.S. postage stayed really busy with my family because we shared experiences in that way. Um, So when I went to school, I had an idea of what to expect. And I'll tell you also, I was a part of a program called Project Upward Bound. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you can Google. Okay. Some of your listeners can Google it if they're not familiar with it. Project Upward Bound, in a nutshell, identified promising students academically and gave them an opportunity to experience what it would be like to live on a college campus before they actually graduated high school. Uh, Thereby, the thinking is that they get a little bit prepped and a lot motivated to actually go to university. That wasn't necessary in my home because mom and dad lived by a mentor in our home that was education is freedom. So none of us ever considered not going to university. However, it was very helpful to me to be a part of Project Upward Bound in terms of actually uh, having a little bit of the experience of living away from home, which was my first time I ever spent a night away from my mom and dad's nest. It also taught me what it was like to experience a dorm life and to meet people from different geographies than mine. So that by fall, when I was formally enrolled as a Uh, as a freshman, I had the experience newness down pat and I could concentrate on the classes. Uh, But in terms of your question, um, my preparation and my thoughts about what I would do professionally, I did not grow up thinking I would be the CEO of a multinational uh, workforce platform uh, organization. I didn't know anything about work other than teachers, preachers and maids in my community and then ad hoc jobs. And so When you think about what I'm doing today, it's really quite a blessing. Yes, a lot of effort have gone into it. But as I said to you earlier, a lot of angel wings have really, you know, been underneath my journey as well. Amen. Yes, I'd completely, you know, relate and definitely have a spiritual grounding. Now, when you graduated, you moved to Los Angeles, correct? What inspired that decision? And, you know, how did Act One Group come about? Actually, I came to California on a vacation. (laughs) Remember, I told you we're a clannish family, right? So with 11 kids, the older one would always have a younger one who they kind of took care of and nurtured. They were responsible to make sure homework was done, chores accomplished, and that we were basically living the life of discipline and and, and learning. And mom ran her, her, her home that way. And so I was Sandy's baby. Sandy was the eldest sibling. And when she went away to university, it felt quite empty for me in that house, even with 10 10 of us still left there, mom, dad, and whoever happened to drop by. But she had moved to California during the uh, finishing of my education. And so I planned to come out to visit her. My dad, our dad passed away in a boating accident on the Eastern shore. And so I said, Mom, I'll stay with you, help you adjust. And we thought that was the plan for a little bit. And then after a couple of weeks, Mom stayed in bed for a couple of weeks over Dad's passing because we didn't find him for a long time, you know, in, an, in, in a storm. We never really 
reclaim dad fully. And so that was traumatic for our family and our community. But mom told me after a couple of weeks, go ahead, take the vacation you intended. If I need you, I'll call you back. But I've got to learn to live on my own at some point. Let me give it a shot now and not get accustomed to having you here. And so I came out to California somewhat poignantly and completing a, uh, uh, the plan for a vacation my sister and I had made earlier. And I'm still on that vacation. <laughs> wow. I never knew that. And and this is from someone who has been stalking your life, studying you from the past several weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so you go to California on this vacation that never ends. Now, when did the Act One group start to formulate? Well, in 1978, I opened doors and I opened doors as a full time placement company. Back then, we used to call it permanent placement, Nikayla, but you know, nothing's permanent. And I don't even know that it's legal to refer to employment as permanent if it's not intended as permanent these days. But back then, I, I was placing people in full time jobs. And the iteration to doing temporary work happened for me because we were doing such a great job at full-time placement that a client asked us to assist them. And I took the same principles of full-time placement into temporary placement. Now that means in a short form that we, when making full-time placements back in the day, and today we still continue to offer 550 in Apple One, which is basically if you hire someone through our organization and they change their employment with or without you in any form within five years, that we replace them for 50 percent of the fee. So you can see handily, it was not worth it to me not to make great placements to make sure in my instance, I was pleasing the applicant. A lot of companies focused on pleasing the employer. And so they take the jelly beans to the employer. But we gave the gems to the applicant with the thinking that if we have people who are happy in their work and happy applicants, then they're going to perform so well for the clients they come back to us. And that continues to work to this day. We say the applicant is the center of our universe. And so when we're working with these uh, companies, when I was working with these companies, I built quite a reputation for delivering really strong candidates. And they asked if I wanted to try temporary. I was not aware that the temporary market by, I won't call the names of competitors back then, but a lot of them are multinational companies and they basically just found bodies and put them in jobs. And I was using my same formula for finding full-time placement in temporary. And I think that's how we built up such a great reputation across the spectrum. Today, we've expanded those services, not only across countries, but also across disciplines. I have background check through HEC America. I have Agile One, which is our workforce solutions group. Uh, we implement technology, so uh, we implement hiring solutions. We implement uh, process and programs for companies that are all centered around making sure they fulfill in a total talent community. And you'll hear a lot about total talent communities as you continue to understand my industry. It's just an industry that I really feel blessed to be in because as you and I both shared earlier, we did did not come from high income areas. So you can do the math and understand that we didn't have a lot of role models around a lot of professional jobs, but I did have strong role models around how to live professionally on a personal level. And I think adding that to just what I've told you is dynamically why we're doing the things we're doing today. Yes. And speaking of that finance piece and the income piece, you know, I've been speaking with a lot of entrepreneurs and guests on the show recently about this idea that entrepreneurs, Black women entrepreneurs, they don't always have that family and friend round of, of fundraising where you can ask your family for 10000 for 5000 and slowly just start to build up a, a substantial amount to launch your company. But what really impressed me about your story is you were able to borrow 900 from your mom, which was I know was not a small amount at the time, and pair it with what you had and start the business. You were able to turn what was that 1500 into now a billion dollar company. Can you talk a little bit about the focus, the financial focus you had to have at that time to grow and scale your company? 
Well, it, it, there are a couple of things that I really want to share about that that I think may feel a little bit dry, but they certainly fuel for a solid soil when one is thinking about entrepreneurship. And by the way, let me first say that I think it's really important to understand that entrepreneurship principles, when well grounded, work in your personal life as well. So let me share with you some ideas and you see if you agree with me, Nikayla. Number one, I believe in the four corners of the contract governing everything legal in a relationship. Many people who start a business are so happy to service and fulfill and build the relationship side of it that they're sometimes not paying as much attention to the four corners of that contract, whether that is a 400 page document or a one page service agreement. It is a contract if it carries a signature with it. And so many companies, including my own, have uh, gone out and created relationships and then we may do little things for the client on the side or the client may say, oh, don't worry about that, you know, do this and we'll come back to that later. And then if disruption occurs in that relationship in a negative way, that contract governs everything in the in the court of law. And it can be very expensive to step outside of a contract. So no matter where your business is, at whatever level of funding you have or don't have, understand if it's a real business and it's doing business through contract, then you've got to honor those four corners. You've got to make sure everything that deviates from what's inside of there is included as an amendment or redrawn. The other thing to understand, and that costs people a lot of money, I think even before we get to the fundamentals of the math, is that uh, companies do big companies. Con- you contract with companies. You do business with people. So when you write a contract with an organization, you're writing a contract with a legal entity. People are going to change in that organization, especially if you service or provide for a length of time. However, on a day to day, you're doing business with people. Never was this more evident for me than when I decided to localize my business. Now, many people talk about globalization. I believe that companies are born global today. The advantage of internet and the sharing of information allows a small little company in Podunk, America to have a first customer in India or Thailand or anywhere one can imagine where there's internet accessibility. And by the way, that's in product and service, which goes back to making sure you understand the contract because different rules and regulations apply, not only in different countries, but even in different areas of the U.S. that can get very expensive. Most companies don't go out of business because they can't find somebody to loan them money, although many don't go into business for that reason. Most companies go out of business because they get caught up in those two principles that I shared with you, honoring the four corners of the contract and understanding that you contract with companies, but you do business with people, which makes it the localization, not globalization. You're going to service people at a very local level, whether that is down the hall in in, in a marketing department as different from the legal department or whether that is in seven different countries versus the home country where you contract it for. Is that helpful? That is helpful. That is helpful. And as you were growing, when did you start to hire? When did you realize that you could actually afford to bring on a team? Well, I had a team before I could afford to bring one on because, you know, I mentioned those siblings who I'm very oh, yes. canish. <laughs> Those who mom and dad said every one of you will go to university. Well, several of them, to be candid with you, before uh, before it was all um, counted, eight siblings have worked in my organization. And uh, the very first was a sister I came to visit who was so helpful in giving me visibility, not only to new client opportunities, but teaching me how to actually set up an office and protocols within an office. From the day I opened my business, I functioned in many of the same ways as I do today because of what Sandy was able to teach me. And then my next employee was my brother, Carlton, who drove across the United States in a Volkswagen. We used to call them punch buggies. It was a (laughs) 
Listen, it was a convertible Volkswagen, so he thought he was really cool. But it applies to another principle. You know, the first thing a lot of us do is go out and buy a car instead of a house. You know, we invest in depreciating assets versus appreciating ones. So I appreciated that depreciating asset when Carlton drove it across country. <laughs> and by the way, you know, you know, Nikayla, he had my mom in the car with him. And because she wasn't a driver, as they drove, two things I'll always remember about their trip when they check in. He shared with me the different songs my mom would sing because she had a song for every location they covered across the United States from North Carolina to California. And then my mom showed up and she was striped like a zebra because the sun hit her on the same side for the full length of that travel. So the day it took them to get here mom showed up looking like a zebra and she had to lay on my three-story beachfront home on one side to try to <laughs> eat it out with the other side for a couple of days oh but you bring back memories for me in the growth of my organization i don't know how interesting that is to you but you really make me think back on some of the moments you it know? is interesting you know and that's why i like to take it back to bring it forward because that, you know, I think sometimes as you have told your stories and shared your stories, these little details, they interest us. Even if times are different now and we can't go out and do the exact same thing, it is interesting to hear that perspective and to understand how you need to be thinking, how you need to be, you know, making lemonade out of lemons and approaching family members if you have to, whatever it takes to build that business. You, you know, uh, just a few days ago, I delivered a keynote to North Carolina Executive uh, Roundtable, wonderful group of people, professionals, see, uh, uh, very corporate level people. And um, I was sharing with them ideas on, um, you know, how to be a millennial, right? How to think like one, how to act like one, and how to appreciate, importantly, one. And one of the things that I shared with them is that millennials value very high up in the food chain a corporation's ability and engagement to team building. I can tell you that, you know, we didn't call it that, but I recall many nights when my team of maybe four or five people were prepping uh, responses for major clients and we turn on Al Green and because I usually had precedent over what they were listening to and they could slip in a little bit of hip hop <laughs> in a while. Uh, but we'd have Al Green blasting through the third, the second floor of our building and We'd be uh, eating. I had a kitchen stove in my corporate office. I had some clients who had heard me talk about uh, fried chicken. My, my my brother said she makes the best fried chicken you ever had. And they, all they wanted was fried chicken when they came. They wanted fried chicken. And so I bought a stove and had it hooked up, gassed wow. up. <laughs> and I fried chicken for that client. Now, we won that account and we still do business with that company more than, you know, uh, 20 years later. But the point I'm making is that we were always engaged in team building. It wasn't formalized and we didn't call it as such. So when you talk about hearing how things were back then, you know, if you if you think about it, team building has been important. It's not a new millennial thing. I tell everybody, people have been transferring from 18 to 35 for years. So yes. millennialism isn't new. You know, we gave it a name because we made them that way. Hey guys, it's Nikayla here with a quick word from our sponsors. So the number one question I get about side hustling is how do I get started? And the other day, I decided to kind of take inventory of what I was doing in my early days of side hustling. How did I get started with Side Hustle Pro? And the biggest thing that stood out to me is that I was always investing in skill and personal development, meaning, and I like to do just-in-time learning. So when I was ready to do something new or try something else, I would invest in a class to learn that skill and then practice implementing it. So the rest of my development and learning came from my actual experience. So I highly recommend you do the same. What is it that you want to do? Do you want to finally put up your website? Then head over to Skillshare and take a class on putting up your website. Do you want to get started with social media and you're not sure how to start? Head over to Skillshare and start taking some classes. Skillshare is so great because it's an online learning community. It has over 25,000 classes in anything you can think of from photography to entrepreneurship, even podcasting. 
And right now they are offering a special offer just for Side Hustle Pro listeners. You can get two months of unlimited access to Skillshare for free. Imagine what you can do in two months, how many classes you can take. But remember to do the implementation piece, all right? So head over to Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro. That's Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro to get started with your two free months. And one more time, that's Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro. If you have a business or you know someone who does, you probably know by now that small business owners, we wear a lot of hats. And some of those hats are mad fun, I'm not going to lie. But some of them, like filing taxes and running payroll, they're not so great. That's where Gusto comes in. Gusto makes payroll, taxes, and HR actually easy for us small businesses. It's fast with simple payroll processing benefits and expert HR support all in one place. Gusto automatically pays and files your federal, state, and local taxes, so you don't have to worry about all that. Plus, they make it easy to add on things like health benefits and even 401ks for your team. So those old school clunky payroll providers that you probably thought you had to look at, they just weren't built for the way we work as modern small businesses, but Gusto is. So let them wear all of those hats for you. You have better things to do. Side Hustle Pro listeners, you get three months free when you run your first payroll. So test it out. See for yourself at gusto.com slash SHP. That's gusto.com slash SHP. Something else that I've been talking about recently with guests and other entrepreneurs is this idea of finding the right client. Not everyone is your ideal client. And so for someone like yourself who started an employment agency, it seems like the world would be your oyster. Like you would just have so many companies to approach. When did you narrow that down or how did you really zero in on what industries you wanted to work with? Who was your ideal client so that you would continue to match employers with happy employees and vice versa. You know, Wells Fargo invited me in to speak at their supplier uh, inclusion forum. Regina Hayward does an Edwards uh, does an excellent job there. And one of my slides was dedicated to the whole uh, conversation you're talking about, which is, you know, select your clients. Don't let them out select you. And I think it's really important to understand who you are as a business, whether that's just you or whether that's you plus few or many. It's really important to select your clients as you would have made the relationship relationship becomes very intense. It is legally driven and it involves money. And so very often it can end up being a relationship that can be governed by many of the principles that you would have in place in a personal relationship if you're having a significant other or a spouse. And I think it deserves that type of that same type of critical attention to selecting a client. There are companies who I would not do business with. And I'll tell you, candidly, it can be so simple as I remember when my sister Trish, who's an engineer, went out and visited a client location where we were going to place light industrial workers. And it would have been a huge volume relationship for us. Uh, but Nikayla Trish came back and she said, you know, before I share my report with you, let me just tell you what's in here, because I was in a rush and I remember the day as if it were yesterday. And um, she wanted to share. She said, well, let me just tell you before I share it with you. The bottom line is you would not send. And she named three people. She said you would not send to work here. Those three people happen to be family members, two of whom are frequently at our Sunday dinner table. They're light industrial workers. They're what we call skilled workers. They work oftentimes at the lower wage end of the uh, totem pole. And she said, so you make the decision on whether you want to fulfill if you really want to accept this contract. But because the company was willing to pay a little extra understanding the risk around workers compensation there. She said, there's a reason why that risk is so high. And it's not the potential of damage. It's the behavior that occurs there. It's the protocols in place to ensure that people are working safely. She'd had a physical visit as an engineer who has a huge understanding and credential and is credentialed around risk aversion. And so when she told me I wouldn't send, you know, 
two of my own family members there and one close friend, it kind of nailed it for me that that wasn't the client for me. There are always signals of buying, of that people talk about buying signals, but I think there are signals why not to do business as well. And I don't care where you are or how hungry you are for business. I encourage my sisters, please don't do business with companies who you would not be proud to tell God was your best client. You got to be able to identify those alarm signals as well as those buying signals. Wow. So did it become a thing of it becoming more word of mouth that clients were attracted to you or were there specific things that you did to market the company? It continues to be that, actually. We call it womb, word of mouth, baby, okay? Um, (laughs) Yeah, Um, most of our relationships were built from the womb. You know, they grew from the womb. Um, And and, and, and I think that continues to be the best way. I mean, even in our industry, we still have that. We have it technologically supported when you see things like Yelp or you see other different ways that people are grading the value. You can see different hand signs or different stars when you go into different places that you're shopping. But there are always ways that people are going to be glass door. You know, there are always ways that people are going to refer you to things. Go on any shopping site today and you can't get out of there without seeing a thumb up or a thumb down or a star or some indicator of, you know, what people think about it. And so I think that you know, for me, before technology offered that, it was people who were offering that for me. But it continues to be, in my estimation, one of the best signals that you've got a great business. I mean, you let a sister you really like or you really admire say something or Instagram or or snap something that she's enjoying. And you're more likely to go buy that than you are by a client telling you through a legacy type advertising about that product. Am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Instagram is my biggest marketing tool. It's where I just went through, I was shopping for vacation and all I did was bookmark, you know, things that I saw on other people and then go to the shop website. I didn't start at the website. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, you know, it allows so many when you talk about entrepreneurship and you talk about finances, it allows so many women to be able to start businesses, understanding that some of their own personal behavioral habits can turn into business practices that work well for them. Think about all the businesses that have grown from the website or grown on the Internet. I said this publicly recently that my son has a friend who started um uh, a business and he built his website, his business is on, uh, focused on autism and his first, he built the business in California and his first client was in India. Wow. You know, so, so, so I just think there's so, there's never been a better time to start a business, to be in business, but it's always the right time to be smart about it. I advise people another financial tip on the backside. If you're interested in starting a business before you put all of your financial resources in it, go use someone else's financial resources. Go to work in a company that does what you think you want to do or has an element strong enough of that that you can learn from it. See where your own ability to sustain from it is. And, you know, look at how you're treated as an employee and reverse that as a lesson for how you will behave as an employer. I've seen a lot of people feel that folks ought to just get in there with them and enjoy their grind or appreciate their grind and boy, I'm on my hustle. But they're not really respecting that your grind is not their grind. Your grind may simply be a job for them, that they're hired underneath it to perform. And unless you're really articulating in a real value-driven way to them, a reason to be invested emotionally as you are, then you've got to respect them that it's another day job for them and they may have their own hustle somewhere else. Amen. That's something I think about a lot. You know, I have been the disgruntled employee (laughs) at many a job, but I'm like, oh, crap. You know, now I'm in the driver's seat. How do I make sure that others don't have that feeling that I once had? Yeah. and, 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 And appreciate that people work for different reasons. There are a lot of people who take a lot of jobs on the way to a great career, you know. Um, And so you've got to appreciate where they are in it. 
I think that when you start to scale your business beyond 10 or 20 people, and that can be sounding very big for some of your folks who are listening and, you know, starting at job one, um, I think it's really important for you to hire both. Hire people who aren't looking to work with you or for you forever. Hire some who want to do a real strong two or three years, and they're just going to be so dynamic in that, that they're building a resume worth paying attention to, and they can really help you. And then you can refresh that talent later. There are some critical areas, depending on your business, where that may not make the best sense, but every business has an opportunity to hire both career-focused, long-term-minded people and folks who are in it for the job today. I think it's really smart to do that. And I don't hear a lot of people talking about that, but I guarantee you a business sustains a lot better if for no other reason than that, that it allows you to consistently refresh your talent in an organization and sometimes the energy and air people are breathing in it by having new people come along. Everybody doesn't have to be committed to your business for the length of their career as long as they can be committed to your business for the length of the assignment you have them on. That is such awesome advice. Thank you. Thank you. So before we jump into the lightning round, I would love to know, you know, from the outside looking in, you are one of the most confident women I've ever come across. And I just wonder, have you ever experienced imposter syndrome? And what were some of the challenges you faced in your business and how did you overcome them? Well, let me just tell you something about this uh, confidence you're talking about. Uh, Knowledge married to experience is what breeds confidence. And so I have been at this for a while, but when I'm engaged in something brand new to me, I'm feeling that same level of uh, energy that you feel Uh, new to whatever you're new to. Adults are just older children. And so we've got to understand that every time we experience something new, the human side of us kicks in. That's why it's so important for the humane side to stay intact as well. Uh, In terms of me being confident, I have gained a lot more confidence today about many things than I did when I started my business in 1978. But I still feel that same level of enthusiasm and energy that anyone would feel. If you talk to entertainers, they tell you the day that they don't feel that level of anxiety before they walk out onto a stage or in front of a camera, they've lost their juice. And so I would pray that All of the women who are listening, keep their juice, keep it sweet, keep it, you know, moving and keep an element of that energy going. But in terms of confidence, yeah, I really think that confidence is bred from really marrying well knowledge to experience. I love that. Keep my juice. Well, I I definitely always feel that anxiety. So I guess the juice is there. (laughs) It is there. It is there. As a matter of fact, if you talk with medical practitioners, they will tell you when anxiety happens, people either go dry mouth or they overwater, you know? So, so, I mean, there's quite a literal uh, meaning to that as well. That isn't so pretty as what we might have. (laughs) And that's what happens in life, isn't it? When we don't get it in handle and we don't do the things we need to do, because, you know, anxiety is really nature kicking in and telling you you need to set some things right. And right. or you need, and sometimes that's just your attitude. It's not really anything lacking in you. So speaking of that juice now, what is next for Act One Group? This is your 40th year, right? In the business. Uh, my business is older than I am, for sure. Uh, so <laughs> I have to tell you that. <laughs> And we are very, very excited about this double millennial business, okay? We're like millennial double, right? Uh, but but, but I'm so excited because we are expanding so beautifully in the markets and industries that we want. Uh, we're very on track for the growth plan we have. And on a personal level, I'm just feeling so much enthusiasm because having that combination I share with you, Nikayla, of well-tenured employees with new, fresh talent that comes into the organization, I'm in a great position to pay attention to some of the other things I enjoy doing as a professional. So you're seeing me out there talking on a lot more campuses and in organizations I care about, organizations like WeBink and NMSDC, WPO. These are all organizations that I pray your listeners are engaged in. And just to make sure they understand, WeBink is a women business enterprise network, and Pam does an awesome job leading that. And then WPO is women presidents and owners. Marsha Firestone heads that Um 
out of uh, New York, but she but it's a global entity and affiliate of WeBank. We've got WeConnect. I'm going to be speaking in Canada coming up soon for WeConnect, and we're going to be streaming. So I hope you'll let your listeners know about that, and we can come back and talk about that experience with you later. These are all organizations that help uh, women who are starting businesses, women who are growing businesses and businesses such as mine. And they have formal programs that are very well tried and proven that assist in MSDC, which is National Minority Supplier Development Council. Uh, they do a fantastic job working with minority owned companies. And then NGLCC, which is National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, is an actual chamber of commerce about the business of commerce for gay, lesbian, transgender, and queer uh, uh, folk. And so all of these organizations I've mentioned offer financial guidance, resources to financial support. Uh, Very often they will host um, events that allow companies to come in and talk about their business, not just around procurement, but around getting angel investors. And it's just a really wonderful segregated toward immediate effort, but all integrated toward the whole outcome of building businesses for women and minorities. And I think I could not complete a conversation without talking about that with you. Well, thank you. You know, I will link to all of those in the show notes, every single one. So thank you for that list, that robust list. Now, what we're going to do is segue into the lightning round, which is just a series of five questions. You answer the first thing that comes to mind. It can be brief. You don't have to elaborate. Are you ready? Well, I'm as ready as I'm going to be. Number one, what is a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? The best resource that's helped me in my business is to do the work on going back and forgiving myself for being uh, female and black and brilliant at the same time. Interesting. Okay. Number two, what's been the best business book or podcast episode or live event that you've consumed this year? Well, Nikayla, aside from yours, right? We got to put yes. yours right up. <laughs> Why, well, thank I you. To come on. So you make sure you put that as number one, but then I'll give you a really nice number two. The best book that I ever read is a book called The Strangest Secret. And it was the first book through the, my relationship with Nightingale Conant that I actually put to auto tunes. And it's out there on YouTube as well, but Nightingale Conant has it available for folks. I read that book over 30 years ago and it impacted me so deeply in how I've built, been able to build my business that all these years later, I reached out to Vic Conant, the son of the original um, owner, and asked if I had his permission to redo and edit and refresh it for younger, newer, uh, more current audience. And he liked what I was doing in business. He liked that I could credit so much success to it that he agreed. And so I'm going to actually have Lead the Field, which is a series of uh, business-focused teachings coming out as well. But right now, I've got As a Person Thinketh and The Strangest Secret that are Nightingale Conant products. They allow me to redo, and that's because those books were really important to how I built my business. May I also say they were important to how I built myself as an adult. Awesome. What a great resource. I can't wait, and I will link to those that are out right now. Okay. Number three, who is a black woman entrepreneur that you would want to trade places with for a day and why? Myself on my best day. Now that's not an egotistical answer. That's the first thing that came to mind because very often I find that I, like many of your listeners, I'm sure can default into some of those isms that kind of shy us away from being our best self. But on my best day, I really do think that that's the most complete I can be. Certainly, I have sheroes who exist for me, um, and they are myriad and they are many. I mean, you know, we can begin with Madam C.J. Walker, who was a great inspiration for me and whose picture hangs big and bold in my office. Elizabeth Cady Stanton graces my front door, along with uh, Mrs. Pankhurst. Uh, You know, there are so many women who I admire who are historical and who are alive today. But the truth is, if I were going to be given an opportunity to exchange places, I'd exchange places from my lesser self to my better self. 
I love that. Number four, what is a personal habit that has helped you and significantly contributed to your success? Discipline. I teach so so often on campuses when I'm talking with young women or in organizations, wherever I'm speaking. I'll be speaking at Bloomberg on Thursday, I believe it is, of this week in San Francisco. And I, 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 I'm always mindful to make sure that, you know, I am uh, sharing out where I personally believe from that. And finally, what is your parting advice for women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss but are afraid of losing a steady paycheck? My best advice is my personal life mantra. Never compromise who you are personally to become who you wish to be professionally. When you get that in place, you truly are free to soar. I'd also say that the title of your uh, uh, of your podcast really suggests it all to them. Understand that you can do things as a side hustle. You don't have to give it all up to have it all. You just may not get it all at once. You know, um, go work for somebody who's doing what you want to do and test it a little bit on their dime before you invest yours in it. It does not have to be a scary proposition because at the end of the day, no matter who signs your check, you write it. All right. All right, Janice. So where can people connect with you after this show? I know you're super busy. Where can they find you? At J. Bryant Howroyd. And they can also go to Ask JBH website. All righty. I will link to that in the show notes. So Janice, thank you so much for being in the guest chair. Nikayla, you know, we're in a season right now of uh, paying attention to women across the globe, whether we're doing that politically, economically, from a point of corporate uh, and social responsibility, or whether it's just because women are taking over in the numbers in the population. The work that you're doing to make sure that we live strong as women is so important. So please let me congratulate you on that. It's such a thrill to talk with you and to enjoy the podcast. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate that. And, you know, guys, there you have it. Hey, hey, thanks for listening. Now stay connected in between episodes by texting Side Hustle Pro to 44222. You'll get my weekly Six Bullet Saturday newsletters where I share what I'm up to, what I'm reading, my business tip of the week, and resources to help you grow your side hustle. And I'm working behind the scenes on some live events, which my email list will get access to first. So make sure you're in the loop. Text Side Hustle Pro to 44222 or visit sidehustlepro.co slash SBS. 